Kevin has got the attendance quiz on the board. Uh, just by way of announcements, uh, some of you have contacted me regarding uh, uh, misses in this class. Uh, most of you, when you missed it, had a good reason. Uh, if you missed, uh, you can make up the credit or uh, the absences you've had. If you'll just get in touch with the county, we'll direct you to uh, some online lectures that you can listen to and, and turn in a report on. Uh, but do it so you don't get that grade in here. Uh, Flash, you should all get an A out of this. Get a hold of Kevin in this class. Our opening prayer uh, this afternoon is given by uh, Sadie Thompson. Sadie's a uh, freshman here from Pleasant View, Utah. Uh, she's undecided on her major, but that can be forgiven. And 
We'll turn the time over to Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Earl. Aloha. Aloha. So it's great to be here. I'm very excited to, to come. Um, it was a fantastic experience working with Brother Earl. Uh, an absolute wonderful boss, a great mentor. Uh, so I appreciate everything he taught me and got me through this point right to be here. It's great to speak to you guys. So uh, I think he exaggerated a little on the introduction, but uh, it was a great experience we got working together. I'm happy to be here. So uh, I'll give you a little more introduction. Uh, Jason ran through a few things, but um, I have had a very diverse background. Uh, part of it was designed to be that way by the company I worked for, Emirates. Um, part of it was just it was the way I grew up. Can you hear me in the back if I don't stand by the microphone? Yes? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, so I studied chemical engineering at BYU. I had the fortune of being raised by an engineer father. Um, and he kind of led me in the direction of becoming an engineer. He, was in, he worked in aerospace and he said, you can't go into aerospace, it's a dying industry. Military spending is going down. So I took a bunch of engineering classes and science classes and math classes, and I liked them all. So I chose chemical engineering, with which fit my background and, and interest. Uh, and then I graduated from it, and then I broke my dad's heart. Um, if you look at his role as an engineer, I'll put up a, a Dilbert comment. This is really what he thought about managers. So when I turned down offers to go to graduate school and get a PhD in engineering to go to business school, this is the path in his mind that I was choosing going into business and going into management. Um, but it, it really helped having a technical background and engineering background. Uh, and then getting to work for a company like Emirates, it was then World Minerals, which was an industrial company where I could use my engineering skills. Uh, so it was great to go work for Professor Earl. I started in finance. After two years of the company in finance, we were acquired by Emirates. So we became a, a little company, but it was still a global company, World Minerals. We, were, we had operations in Asia, Europe, South America, the US, and then we became part of Emirates, which was a, a big mining company. Uh, and at that time, I switched from working in finance to going to work to one of our operations in Longfoot, California, which I'll talk more about a little later. And I was a plant manager there. Uh, so it was after being a plant manager, working in the plant and operations for two years, when I quit the company, start my own business, my carnivore, um, and I became a plant manager over real plants, like carnivorous plants, being a supply trap and other carnivorous plants, and I was managing those plants instead of the big mining plant. Uh, and that was a great experience being an entrepreneur. This was a concept for my carnivore that I came up with and with a team, and it created and managing new ventures class at BYU Provo. Uh, so it was a business plan we wrote for the class, we entered the BYU business plan competition, got second place, and got $10,000. And then we all graduated and did nothing with the business. And then it was about four years later when I launched the business full time. Uh, and my dad, the engineer, said, you will fail, it will never work. Nobody will pay more than $5 for a carnivorous plant. And I was successfully selling them for $20. So it's the, the engineering perspective uh, versus with the business background, you can see a, a niche market, you can see a better way to market, a target group where you can get a premium and make a business successful. Uh, after that time, I, went, I was recruited back to Emirates by the vice president there, uh, who brought me back in as a sales director. Uh, so I mean, coming out of my carnivore marketing company, really, uh, I went into sales and was the uh, global sales director for the, our business unit, still based in California. I did that for two years. When Emirates acquired a new company, uh, we bought a big mining company that mined cow. And uh, at that time, as soon as the acquisition went on day one, I went over to that new company and became their general manager for this new division that we created. So a little about, and, and I've been doing that role for almost five years now, the same role as general manager. So a little about Emirates. I, I won't go into too much detail about it, but it is a global mining company based in Paris. We've got revenue of 3.7 billion euro, which is about 4 billion US dollar. Anybody from Japan here? No? Okay, it's half a trillion yen. Everything sounds more impressive than yen, so half a trillion yen revenue. Um, you can see our operating income is a very profitable business. As far as mining companies go, this is a profitable company. 
it's well run, well managed, all over the world. Uh, almost 15,000, actually this was before our latest acquisition, so now we have about 17,000 employees and 300 operating sites where we stand now, and close to 5 billion euro in revenue. So the main product in my division is a mineral called talc. Has anybody heard of talc? No? Nobody? Going on? No? Okay. One of the most common uses of talc, baby powder, is made out of talc. So we make baby powder. Baby powder is fantastic when you go to the beach. Put a little on after playing in the sand. Put it on your babies when you're done playing with them in the sand. The sand goes away and it's clean and dry. Only if you use talc. And Johnson's brand, because we supply Johnson's. Don't buy other brands. <laughs> Uh, but most of our talc actually goes into industrial applications. If I look around this room, there are numerous products on your carpet backing, on those tables, on the paint, um, probably some, if you have cell phones, the batteries in your cell phones, your, your laptops have minerals in the plastic around them. Everything has minerals, and Emmer supplies minerals to everything. It's a very fascinating markets and, and applications and opportunities. So it's a great company, I'm happy to work with them. It's been about 10 years. So I want to ask you guys, I want to focus this on entrepreneurialism. So what's a good definition for an entrepreneur? That's a good definition. Someone who manages risk. Manages risk. Excellent. Any other ideas? Okay, I think that's a good definition. Um, any French speaking students here? All right, so entrepreneur is a French word. How would you translate it? Uh, in between thinking. A what? Like literal words, long quote, is between and no, is someone who takes. So you take something in between? Okay. Um, the, the word was actually coined by a, a French person, Jean Baptiste Say. Uh, in, in English, sometimes we, we hear it as an adventurer. But I really, this is a translation of his definition. It's actually a beautiful definition. Next one. All right. Um, entrepreneurs seek out inefficient uses of resources and capital and move them into more productive, higher yield areas. I mean, this guy was obviously an academic. Uh, to come up with a definition like that, but to think about it, it's actually a really interesting idea. Coming to Hawaii, I actually see this all around the island here. A great example of real entrepreneurism following this definition are your food trucks. Why do you need a big, expensive building to serve food to people? So that a, a big restaurant is a big issue of resources and capital. When you can provide great shrimp out of a truck on the side of the street and move it around to your customers rather than your customers to come to you. Uh, so that is moving capital and resources into a more productive, higher yield area. So I want to talk about entrepreneurism um, because when I started my company, I was on my own. I started as myself um, and I, I grew the business, but it was still mostly a one-person job. And I think really an entrepreneur, you might start off as yourself, but you become a leader. You become, your, hopefully your venture becomes more than one person. And at that point, you become a leader. And your goal as a leader is to create an environment where entrepreneurialism will continue to thrive, where you can continue to pull in those great traits of an entrepreneur, managing the risk, bringing creativity in, and inspiring others to have that same culture. So really, as an entrepreneur, you're creating this environment for a culture. In the corporate world, culture is a very big thing. Uh, I think for, for you all here to, in, in Hawaii, Polynesian Cultural Center, obviously culture is a big part of your tradition, your lifestyle, and in the corporate world is no different. We just have different cultures that exist there, but every company has a culture, and that culture is set and maintained by the leadership of the company. So I, I believe for an entrepreneur, a big part of their role is they state to create this new venture is to maintain and manage that culture. And a culture is shared values and beliefs among the people. Anybody recognize this area on the map? Mm. Where is it? Oh, sorry. My slides are not seen. Somehow I got off you guys. Sorry about that. Sorry to get that on track. This is in 
California. Anybody from this area? Hopefully not if you didn't recognize it. Um, this is the Bay Area of California. So right here at the tip you have San Francisco, and down here you have Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is one of the most beautiful examples of culture and you know, entrepreneurialism. And where it started, there, there could have been two maps that I could have shown you here. In the 1920s and 30s in the US, there were two potential high tech centers developing. One of them was the Bay Area, Silicon Valley. The other was in Boston, just outside of MIT. It was called Route 128. A lot of startups were going to Route 128 when two people started a company in Palo Alto, California. So this is a picture of Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard. You can probably guess what company they started. Hewlett Packard. And uh, they started this company in 1938 with $538 in capital. That was a few hundred dollars in cash and a Sears Craftsman drill press. And out of that, they made the first HP product. Uh, and they've been, they were really the first high-tech company in Silicon Valley. Um, they started in this garage. This garage is now a museum in California. It's worth millions and millions of dollars. Uh, it's a tiny little garage in Palo Alto. Um, and the reason the company is Hewlett Packard and not Packard Hewlett is a coin toss. <coughs> a Hewlett one. So that's a good way to name your company, flip a coin, figure out what your company is going to be and work for them. And now their company has over, um, I think it's a, just a huge amount of revenue. Um, and it's a very successful company. Um, but they really weren't the founders of the Silicon Valley culture. They were the first company. But it was these eight people who started the culture of Silicon Valley. They were the, the person who invented the transistor. Transistor is really the integrated circuit in your computers and everything else electronic. It was invented by a person named William Shockley. He won the Nobel Prize for it. And he decided he was going to start a company to make these transistors into products. So he did a great thing as an entrepreneur. He went and hired the best and brightest people that were possible. And he brought them all to uh, Palo Alto, San Jose, Silicon Valley, California, and started a company called Shockley Laboratories. And they were going to make the best transistors, and they were going to use this new technology to come up with some great ideas and products. The problem is, William Shockley was a brilliant engineer and scientist, but a horrible manager. He did not trust his employees. He did not uh, allow communication between them. He micromanaged everything they did. So he wanted to do a startup company, but he brought the wrong culture into it. And because of that, these eight employees started colluding with each other and decided, well, this is a great technology, but it's being managed poorly by William Shockley. We are going to leave and start our own company. So these eight people called the Trader Estate, <coughs> Silicon Valley because they started Silicon Valley, left Shockley because he was a bad manager and started their own company called Fairchild Semiconductor. And what they did when they created Fairchild Semiconductor, they didn't create a company, they created a culture. And within this culture, it was a very entrepreneurial spirit. People shared information freely. They talked with each other. They tried out new ideas. They were willing to do anything. They took risks. And uh, a very unique thing about this area is when you had an idea, you would start a new company with that idea. But you would still keep in touch with all your old friends at the old company and share information. There was no such thing as a non-compete. You couldn't, you weren't restricted from going from one company to the other, and you weren't restricted from talking to people to previous company. So this was the culture that became Silicon Valley. And out of these eight people, this is a map of all of the companies that were started it's a genealogy. The company started by these eight people. So on the left, you've got Shockley Transistor going to Fairchild Semiconductor. And every company in Silicon Valley started, to trace their genealogy to Fairchild Semiconductor. This is the culture. People share information. They create ideas. They create technology. And the technology that came out of here is probably the, the best example in the world of high tech growth. Um, this only goes up through 1985. I know it's hard to see because there are just so many companies. But of the Trader Estate, two of them founded the Intel. One of them uh, became part of the biggest venture capitalist in the Bay Area, a client of Perkins. And uh, just every other company came in. It's really an amazing thing. And this culture in Silicon Valley still exists. 
which is why Amherst decided to put its headquarters in Silicon Valley, because we wanted to participate in this culture of entrepreneurism and freedom of information and ideas. But not every company is structured that way. Sadly, this is a picture where uh, Professor Earl and I work. This is Longboat, California. It's a little like to see it, but this is our mining facility and our mineral processing plant in California near Santa Barbara. It had a culture of its own. It was not the Silicon Valley culture. Um, people did not work together well. They did not share information. People, when you were good at something, you kept it to yourself so that you, I guess you were creating job security. You didn't want others to know what you were doing and how you were doing things because you, you wanted to not feel needed by the company. Um, it's, it's good for that person, but it's bad for the company, it's bad for the environment. So when I left Longboat after two years, I had a personal motto. And that motto was, if you want something done right, do it yourself. So when I left there, I felt the only way to get something done is if I do it, because I don't trust the people I work with. I don't feel they're empowered to do it as well as I could. If I did it myself, I'd feel it would be better outcome than if I trust somebody else and empower them and help them do it. And that's the culture I left when I started my own company, my carnivore. And unfortunately, I applied that same culture to my carnivore. This was my startup company. I did everything myself because I thought I could do it better. I spent three, four months making my own website which I could have easily outsourced to somebody else and spent that time doing something more valuable. Every day I would spend hours in the greenhouse packaging products, my plants, and taking them to the post office and mailing them. I would print the shipping labels. I did everything myself because I felt I could do it better myself than somebody else could. And because of that, my company could never grow because I was the one who was going to be out marketing the product, making new products, finding new opportunities, meeting with potential customers, developing a lower cost supply chain. But instead of doing those things, I was packing product in the greenhouse. Um, and a lot of that, I think, is because I created this culture in my car. Or yes, it was one person, but my culture there is I had to do it myself to get it done right. And that was my biggest mistake as an entrepreneur. I should have brought more people in. I should have hired help. I should have hired others to help out in the business be more successful so I can use my time for better things. So that's, you can see two different cultures there uh, and how it impacts the community. So now I'm back at Empress. I'm in a very fortunate position to be a general manager, which means I'm responsible for an entire division. I have about over 250 million in revenue in my division and over 500 employees. <coughs> and then I've got all of the teams reporting into me for sales and marketing and production um, and finance, etc. But because I'm part of a company, I can't define the culture for the entire organization. Emirates is a French-based company. It has a, a culture based in Paris that is spread out throughout the organization. When I first became a general manager, I tried to adapt. I, I had learned from my mistakes with my partner where I realized I needed to set a different culture. And I tried to create a purely entrepreneurial culture at Emirates, and it didn't work because I was not being consistent completely with the corporate culture. So they were getting one message from me on how I wanted to do things and a different message from corporate. And that is a big challenge um, when working for a large corporation. But I could work very hard and do my best to create a specific culture within my division and wherever I could have that go down. Uh, and really, since being an Emirates, my attitude has changed. I used to say in Longboat, if you want something done right, I have to do it myself. Now my attitude is, if I want something done right, I have to give it to somebody else because they're going to do a better job than I am. And I'm starting to sound a little, a little like that Gilbert comment, so I'm getting worried now. Um, but I have a fantastic team, and they are empowered, and, and they, they can do things their own way. It's different how than I do it, but it works. And it lets them only to be successful and be their own entrepreneur over their field. So as I look to balance this corporate culture versus the entrepreneurial spirit, there are three guiding principles that I use. And they come from a Russian engineer. Any Russian speakers here? All right, can you read that name, please? 
Piotr Jokovic Palczynski. Yeah, so I will call him Peter Palczynski if that's okay. Um, so he was a Russian engineer. He had the privilege of being born in Russia in the late 1800s. Um, grew up and became a mining engineer. So really close to my heart working for a mining company. He was a mining engineer, but unfortunately he got caught up in the politics of Russia. And Russian politics in the early 1900s weren't the prettiest. Uh, there was a revolution in 1905, and unfortunately he had some disagreements with the government, and he was exiled to Siberia for eight years. So this nice young engineer with the family in Siberia eight years. He comes back after eight years, and guess what he does? He goes to work for the government again. So very loyal guy. Even after they exiled him, he still comes back to work for them again. And as an engineer, he's also an engineer in 1917 during the revolution. And he begins, he comes actually pretty high up in the Stalin government. And Stalin had a culture of his own. One of Stalin's ideas was technology decides everything. The culture for us is going to be go big with technology. We're going to be the biggest and the best, and we're just going to go, there's a new concept, we're going to make it big. And it, was a, it seems like a good idea, but Peter Polchinski had a different culture. He said technology is nice, but people matter too. There's a social aspect to everything we do. And if we ignore the social aspect and just focus on the technology, or just focus on the product, or something else, you're going to miss it and you're not going to be successful. So he tried to bring a social aspect into engineering projects. He worked on three very large projects for Stockholm. Uh, the first was a mining, a big mining site that's called Magnetic And Russia found the largest iron ore site in this huge mountain, and they were going to mine it. And they would have enough iron to last for hundreds of years. And so Stalin said, build the biggest mining city ever, and we're going to be rich in iron. What they didn't, what Stalin didn't recognize is this mining site was way out in the middle of nowhere. And once you got that iron ore, it was almost impossible to bring it to anywhere where you could actually use it. But anyway, they built it. Peter Polchinski said, this is a bad idea. Here's why it's not going to work. Do it anyway. So they built it. The second project he worked on was a, a dam on the Niper River. And we need electricity. Let's build the world's largest hydroelectric electric plant. And so they were going to do it. It was huge, the biggest dam ever. So Peter said, no, you can't do this. The, the, there's not enough water. The water moves too slowly here. You will never be successful in it. And sure enough, they built this dam, and it never really worked. There wasn't enough water. Nobody did a test. Nobody did a study. They just said, let's build the biggest dam ever. The third project we worked on was actually the most tragic. It was the, a White Sea Canal. They wanted to build a canal so that they could transport goods back and forth. And unfortunately, the canal was poorly designed, but it was going to be the biggest and the best that saw um, So when they went to build it, it froze in the winter, so completely unusable for six months. And most summers, there wasn't enough rain, so it was unu unusable during most summers. Here's the tragic part. In the building of this project, and this is really what got Peter Polchinski upset, 20,000 people, not worked on the project, 20,000 people died trying to make this canal. Absolutely incredible loss of life to build a canal that didn't work because it wasn't engineered properly. And the social aspects were completely ignored. Like there is no thought to the people or the culture. It's just go with the technology. <coughs> Peter Polchinski spoke up against this and was never seen again. He was executed for his disagreement with Stalin's uh, engineering approach. But what he came up with were three guiding principles that I use all the time in my company and that are fantastic for creating an entrepreneurial environment. First, seek out new ideas and try new things. You have to find new ideas and always be looking for new opportunities. Second, when trying something new, do it on a scale where failure is survivable. When Stalin went to build a dam, he didn't do a small pilot. He built a big one and it failed. He didn't know it would fail but he didn't try it out first. Everything I do with my business, I'll talk to my engineering director and he'll have an idea. And he'll tell me his idea and I'll say, well, what's the cost of failure? 
Well, the cost of failure is we lose you know, a month of work for this guy because he'll spend his time on it. Okay, that's survivable, let's do it. We get to try out a lot of new ideas and develop new products and try new processes because we understand that the cost of failure is small. If the cost of failure is too large, we say no. Find a different way to do it where you can prove out your idea without costing too much. <clears throat> and the third one is the most important and most easily skipped. Seek out feedback and learn from your mistakes as you go along. Doing a pilot study, doing a test market, doing a focus group isn't any good if you don't learn from it and incorporate it into your next step. So this is an iterative process. You go back and try it again with the feedback and the learning that you got. These are fantastic principles for an entrepreneur where you don't have the resources to go big at first. You need to prove your concept, prove your product, prove your market on a small scale where you can survive it, but still learn enough from it to make your second go around better. What I love about these principles is they work just as well as in an entrepreneurial environment, pure one, as they do in a corporation. So with the understanding that culture is really the driving force of entrepreneurialism, I'd like to point out a few specific areas of where the skills of an entrepreneur fit into the corporate world and how you can create that culture whether you're starting your own company or working for a bigger company. Um, so if I look at some of the skill sets that are common among the two, first of all, building your team. Inverse is a very lean company. We pride ourselves on, on not having a lot of employees and people are really, a lot of it is expected out of them. Which means everybody on my team has to deliver. I've got to pick people very carefully because I don't have an extra headcount to afford somebody who's not going to deliver exactly what I need. As you're starting a company, you need to make sure you have the right people on your team who are going to do the job. You just can't afford to have somebody who doesn't deliver what you need. The market drives demand. We focus everything we do on unmet needs. Feel the drain. Anybody seen the movie? Do you, you? I know I'm really old. Um, Kevin Costner says, if you build it, they will come. That, that's the idea of the movie. That is a horrible idea. <laughs> if you build it, they will not come. They will come if they need it. Don't just build what you want to build. Find out what the market needs, and that's what you, you build. That's what you make. That's how you're going to make a company and actually get sales. So there's not a field of creative entrepreneurialism or in the corporate world. Find out what you need to go for it. Creativity drives innovation. You've got to have creativity. Um, <laughs> the unfortunate thing in the corporate world is they like a lot of models and systems. And it's very hard to put a system around creativity. Um, you could say, well, you've got to write these reports and fill out these forms and go through this process. We do have a stage gate process for innovation and new product ideas. But when your first step of the process is to write a 10 page document, you pretty much kill creativity. I'm working with a startup company uh, who was a PhD chemist for 3M. 3M historically has been a brilliant, innovative company with new ideas coming out to the market all the time. This chemist left 3M because 3M had a new corporate initiative to apply a Six Sigma process to their innovation. This means putting a big structure and framework around creativity where you've got to go through certain steps and you follow a certain process and make sure you're streamlined and make sure that everything's in order or we're not going to go with that innovation. And he said, you've just killed all my creativity and ability to create a product, I'm leaving. And he went and started his own company. So there is a, a trap for corporations to try to structure things. You've got to keep that creativity out there. Must constantly change and adapt. That's true for every business. If it's not true for a business, they're probably going to be going out of business. There are a lot of businesses that fail to adapt, and you see a lot of businesses die because of it, or get left behind with the new technology. Um, listen, learn, and try again. That's really the Polchinski principles. And finally, you must sell and promote projects within the corporation. Just because I work for a corporation doesn't mean I don't do elevator pitches all the time, because I have to get approval for money. I've got to get capital spending approved. I've got to get approval for resources to be allocated to my division. So I still use those selling skills. 
I, every chance I get, I have to present my results to the um, board of directors of Emirates every quarter. And every chance I can, I pitch my latest product so they start thinking about it. And I pitch the project <coughs> and, the and they start thinking about it. And I needed $20 million to build a new plant. And when I was ready to ask for the money, he approved it in a couple of days because I had been pitching this idea to him for so long. It was just a formality because he already knew all the details. So salesmanship, pitching yourself, pitching your ideas is just as valid in any environment. So there are some great aspects of being an entrepreneur in a corporate environment. I get a paycheck um, every two weeks. I never have to worry about that. It's the same amount every time. Um, also, when I need money, I can raise $20 million by going to the CEO and asking for $20 million. Yes, I have to do a lot of paperwork to justify it, but I can get the money because Emirates has that kind of money sitting around waiting for big projects. Um, so I really don't have to worry about investors. I don't have to worry about where the money is going to come from for my next big idea. It makes it easy to innovate in launching products. Um, I have a global resources at my fingertips. If not in my division, but within Emirates, there are divisions in Asia, Europe, South America, everywhere in the world. There's entire departments for marketing, finance. Um, I've got access to five or six different R&D labs, all with different expertise. So it's really fantastic to have these resources available. Um, so anything I need, I can reach out and say to the marketing guy in Europe, how's the market for this product in Europe? What do you think it, it needs to be successful there? How do I pitch this in South America? Um, what's happening with the exchange rate there? How, how is America, how are American products being it's really great to have those resources. Um, and the greatest thing is it's easy to hide the losses. We tried to launch a product called Interclass. I lost a million dollars last year on this new product launch. You know, nobody really noticed this because I would say, yeah, it didn't work, we lost a million dollars. But energy prices were low, I was able to hedge in a better exchange rate between the US dollar and Canadian dollar, and I made up for it. So, you know, if, if you're an entrepreneur and you lose a million dollars, Depends on the size of your investors and how they feel. That could be a pretty big deal and that can kill your venture. But with an incorporation, you get a little more flexibility. So it sounds really nice and great, so now we'll go into the downsides. <laughs> so I've got two slides here. The first are the traps. And this is really what you've got to overcome. And the second thing are what really kills entrepreneurialism. So the traps are a publicly traded company. Unfortunately, in the world today, my opinion is publicly traded companies are very focused on short-term results. So I was in a meeting with our CEO, and I asked him, what are your objectives? And he said, the Emirates Board of Directors has two objectives. The first is to maximize current year operating income. We have to be as profitable as possible this year. Second, dramatically transform Emirates over the next five years. Those goals are completely in contrast with each other. You can't completely change a company and open up new markets and new opportunities and new products when all you care about is current year operating results. So it's very difficult to, to be in this environment where short-term results drive so many decisions. It's actually very frustrating. Um, my manager does not share my same culture, as Professor Earl knows. Um, so I want to move quickly. He wants to move slowly. I can't get approval for things until he's gone through 10 rounds of analysis. And by then, the opportunity's passed and you move on to something else. So it's really hard to have conflicts with the manager. Uh, cultural classes, clashes. What I say as a general manager, my number one job is to protect my employees from Emirates. Emirates is very consuming and very demanding. So I try to keep my companies away from this corporate giant that loves meetings that loves reports, that loves internal analysis, and almost to the point where the customers seem to come last sometimes. Um, I get a lot of advice with our legal team because they want to contract for everything, and I'd rather move faster and work on a handshake that doesn't work in the corporate world. And I especially get a lot of advice with our intellectual property legal team. They have this strategy where they would rather, Emerson likes to own things. We want to own the intellectual property. So they would rather own all of nothing than part of something. So I want to cut a deal, do a joint venture, share the IP ownership. They're like, no, we don't share IP ownership at all. And I'm like, well, this opportunity won't exist for us. We'll get nothing if we don't move forward. Wouldn't we rather have part of something? No, we'd rather have all of nothing. 
So uh, I've lost that quite many times. So I have something here called the view factor. Uh, this is the ratio of time spent looking up versus looking down. And by looking up, I mean spending time reporting to my boss, updating him on the business. And looking down is time looking at my team, my direct reports. And looking out is looking at the customers in the market. <coughs> Sadly, I often spend most of my time looking up, uh, dealing with internal meetings, budgeting processes, and it keeps me from engaging with my team and engaging with the market. So that's a big challenge in the corporate world, is how do you stay market focused when cameras could consume 100% of my time? One of our marketing directors, who Professor Earl knows well, Tom Sofizio, and this is a direct quote, said, we spend all of our time making PowerPoint presentations while our competitors do nothing to focus on eating our shorts. Direct quote. But he's right. Our competitors don't have big meetings all, all day meetings. They go out in the market and they meet the customer needs. So we need to make sure that's our focus, but it, it doesn't always work that way. So real quickly here, things that kill entrepreneurialism. You can read over these, but in any environment, entrepreneurial or corporate, you've got to trust people, you've got to empower people, you will never have control, you just need to be flexible and adaptable and anticipate areas rather than expect control. And through lack of communication, so as, as leaders going out into the world, you are empowered to create a culture in your work environment and influence it. Um, and, and I think you'll see that you can have a lot of influence. I've been able to create this environment within my division that follows these entrepreneurial principles as much as possible. And yes, a lot of my time is as a shield. I go to meetings and I don't let my team come to those meetings because they're all internal meetings. I want them out doing real work. Um, but it, it, it keeps that environment thriving. So a couple points here. Gain as much diversity and expertise as you can. My background really prepared me well for my job. I was fortunate to have a technical background, work for a mining company, get experience in sales, finance, operations, before going into general management. But really never stop learning. Always continue to learn. I'm still learning today. Um, you're not going to work in isolation. Don't develop that culture that killed my start the company, my carnival, when I wanted to do everything myself. And your role as a leader is to define the culture and be consistent with it. You can't say I have an entrepreneurial culture, but then micromanage your people. You've got to really embody that culture and be consistent. The Polchinski principles are fantastic. They apply everywhere you can for you to use those. And just to summarize the pros, being an entrepreneur in the corporate world is fantastic because I get money, I get opportunities, I get resources, and I can hide my losses. But it is, it is tough. I don't have the full freedom and flexibility that I can enjoy. There's projects that I want to do, I can't do, I can't do this as fast as I'd like to. Uh, so, so there's pros and cons to everything. Uh, and then there's always those bureaucracy and politics that, that get in the way. Uh, but is, I want to go back into that first quotation. Entrepreneurs seek out inefficient use, uses of resources and capital. If you look at the world today, there is so much inefficiency. There seems to be everywhere you go, you see inefficiency. There are so many opportunities to do things better. So your role is to find these inefficiencies, find these unmet needs, and figure out a way to do them better. How can you do them with less capital required? How can you do them faster? How can you better meet the needs? and make things more efficient. And there are so many opportunities out for you to do that. And you can have this, this mindset and this approach, whether you're starting your own company, working for a small startup, or working in a bigger company. Thank you. Ideas I kind of tossed around. 
but nothing that's really attractive enough to go do it. I think if I did it again, I could definitely be more successful with everything that I learned my first time around. Build a team right away, bring in resources, don't be afraid to spend money. Uh, get in money from investors um, if you need it. So I, I hope to someday if I see the right idea, I definitely be willing to get into it again. What would be the biggest thing that would keep you from doing that again? Like, if you want to get a paycheck, it's hard to, to give it up. <laughs> so I would say going into something, I want to make sure that I can continue to provide for my family during the transition. So either getting some funding up front or just seeing a, a fast path to revenue. And I've got um, some Emirates paraphernalia, their little Emirates flash drives for those who ask questions. So I'll have this up here for you. I, I won't try to throw it to you. <laughs> Meeting unmet needs. It's 
it's all the skills of an entrepreneur. It's having that drive to do things differently than the way it's been done in the past. So I, I think MRS recognizes, luckily, that there's a better way to do things. And if you just hire somebody who's going to come in and do things, do things the same way over and over and apply the proven principles and use all the DuPont ratios, you're just going to maintain your business. And some businesses you want to maintain, and other businesses are growth. And we see our business as a growth business. And for a growth business, you need that mindset of doing things differently and trying to, to focus on these unmet needs and developing new ideas. So I think it really is deciding that we're a growth business and a growth company. And not all companies have that culture, but if you do go to a company, make sure it is a culture that will support entrepreneurialism. Otherwise, you're just miserable filling out forms and doing processes. You said that you changed your culture of like having more open, um, or being more open about ideas in your company. How did you go about establishing that culture in your company? So we, in, in the mining industry and mineral processing, we, we have a lot of silos. So we store our minerals in silos. So we'll have a plant that'll have ten silos, and there's only one product per silo. So we created a whole thing for the year. <coughs> We don't want sales in one silo and marketing here and new product development here. We really want to have this network where people talk to each other. So one way of management is to really have everybody report to me. I get all the information and I pass it down. That's less effective. What I wanted is my sales director and my marketing director and my lab manager getting together all the time. So we would set up meetings intentionally with me not there, with these guys getting together. And I would set some of them up and just not invite myself and just have them get together because we wanted to force them to work together, spend time together, and share information. We did newsletters, we did everything we can to break down barriers. And it starts with me also. I, I held quarterly phone calls with the entire division, everything from my directors to the, the janitors and um, the, the plant workers. Everybody was invited to the meeting where I would update them on the progress of the business, what we're doing, how we're doing, what our new ideas are. So it's just creating this culture where people feel open to sharing information and communicating with each other independently of their manager. I, I think that really helped to get people working together. You said that you spend most of your time looking up rather than down, but for entrepreneurs, entrepreneur, is that avoidable? You know, you're right. I'm not, as an entrepreneur, you're going to have to look up some investors. You're going to have to get sources of money. You're going to have to look for acquisitions, an exit strategy. I would say the most important thing, though, is to not let that consume you and make sure that you are spending enough time looking out to the market and to the customers and then taking care of your employees and making sure that you're maintaining this culture. There was a time when I went out on a trip to meet three entrepreneurial startup companies that we were looking at buying. And that trip changed my whole approach because I realized meeting with these three startup companies that we were looking at buying how much time I had been focused on inverse and internal meetings and not looking at the customers in the market. It was an entirely different perspective. I went home from that trip and just realized I got to start saying no to meetings, I got to start minimizing meetings, I got to do things differently. So I can be like these startup companies, I can be 10 times the speed we were. And these guys were running circles around us. Um, we are still trying to buy one of those companies. Um, I don't think we'll end up buying them, but we're going to end up doing a joint venture development with them. Because these small companies are a lot faster than we are. So if, if I was not looking out enough, I'm going to miss these opportunities. So it's definitely a balance. You just got to keep yourself in check. So it's that, that few factors, finding the right ratio, and making sure you force yourself to maintain it. Amherst would love it if I spent 10 hours a day in meetings with them. They would absolutely love it. But I just got to say no. Actually, they'd probably prefer 12 hours a day. Do you remember those? Have you seen your culture rubbing off on um, your current company that you're with? Because you said they were always saying no, 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 but... Um, I would say in some cases, yes. Um, I'm lucky that this division that I managed we acquired, so it was never part of Amherst before. So they, they never really became you know, Amherst-sized. But I don't see... I see slowly some people catching on because our division is very successful. We've been fortunate to have good markets, good opportunities. We've grown 10% a year in our earnings every year. So 
So I think people see the success of the division. There was we set up a lab in San Jose, and the lab was a total failure the first year. And I think we've been able to implement more of our culture there, and we're starting to see some fantastic results out of the lab. People now are, are sharing information. Everybody used to just have their own experience and not share, and now they're looking up to each other. So yeah, I am starting to see it spread, but I don't see it ever going to there. And then there's just two deeply rooted by the senior executives there. Yes? Uh, this is kind of different, but with your personal income, do you invest in other things, or what do you do with your paychecks? Uh, you know, I, I would say two things. One, my job is very time consuming. Uh, so between my time at work and then family, I really pay no attention to anything else. So I, I don't really look at investing in other things right now just because of lack of time. And two, living in California is really expensive. <laughs> uh, but, but I mean, so right, I would say I, I'm not really interested in it right now, just with my job in there. So. Yeah. And then what are your future plans? How much more long are you going to stay there or are you eventually? I, I love my job. It is completely enjoyable. So I, I love my team. Um, I, I really enjoy what I do. I, I see incredible opportunities. We're building this new $20 million plan right now in Vermont for investing in our business. We have an incredible product portfolio that over the next three years is going to be rolling out. So I'm really excited to stay with Emirates. Um, so I, I, I haven't really thought about looking at other things. Um, but you know, obviously I can't say the same job forever. So eventually at some point, I do definitely really have those values and materials inside of me. So if there's the right opportunity, I'm definitely